You are listening to the Teal Talk podcast from the Ohio Alliance to End Sexual Violence. We are a statewide coalition that advocates for comprehensive and equitable responses for survivors of sexual assault. This podcast initiative works to tackle some of the most pressing intersectional challenges for survivors both in Ohio and globally. I'm Olivia Montgomery, Coordinator for Equity and Inclusion with the Alliance, and a link to learn more about OAESV will be available in the episode notes. Today we are joined by Camille Crary, a brilliant lawyer and Director of Legal Services with the Ohio Alliance to End Sexual Violence. In this episode, we will hear about what legislative advocacy looks like for survivors, what it's like working across partisan lines, and what OAESV has accomplished in this realm of advocacy so far. So Camille, first of all, thank you so much for joining me. As I was thinking of subjects that we could discuss, it hit me that I admittedly have no idea how legislative advocacy works day to day and how exactly the legislative process uh, looks in real life to help support survivors. So I thought that that would be a really awesome place to start. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Policy really is my favorite thing to talk about. So I really enjoy getting into the weeds and I appreciate any excuse to do that. Um, so I, I just wanted to start by talking about some of the differences between federal and state policy. And I'm really glad that you had brought up how legislation in you know, states and localities and policies around the world really affect survivors because each jurisdiction and location really has its own unique system, especially in the United States. Every state has its own uh, schedule that it uses in its own systems. So I wanted to talk a bit about the distinction for our work between the federal level and state level policy, kind of who steers which and what it looks like day to day. So at the federal level, lawmakers make decisions about funding for survivor services, for criminal system institutions, for medical programming, education systems, and a lot of other institutions that survivors interact with. Um, then we also have the executive branch, which controls cabinets um, and federal agencies like the Department of Education, um, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, um, et cetera. And so the executive branch then controls regulations like those governing Title IX and immigration law execution. So when we work with our partners, you know, we have a pyramid kind of system that we have within the realm of the work that we do. And we have every state has its own individual rape crisis programs that serve local areas. Those folks do the community level work and then their state level coalitions do the state advocacy at that state legislator. And then our partner, NAESV, the National Alliance to End Sexual Violence, monitors the day-to-day -day, um, executive branch movements and legislative branch movements, and to some extent what's going on at the Supreme Court as well, to the extent that we can make changes to that. And so we really, as a coalition, follow what NAESV tells us to do when it relates to Ohio federal lawmakers. So they're watching day-to-day -day committee schedules at the federal level. They're watching what's going on. And if there's an Ohio lawmaker that can be influential in a decision or a change, they will ask us to reach out to that lawmaker. Sometimes we do our own independent outreach to those folks, but really we do have a heavy reliance on our partnership with NAESV. And we do have weekly meetings with them so that we're keeping up to date. We can ask questions about positions. Um, and you know we're an active partner in that partnership, but it really helps to have someone else monitoring federal action and federal movement. Um, so at the state level, that's sort of the role that we play. So we have our Ohio State House. Um, and I'm going to rely a little bit on Schoolhouse Rock and the song, I'm Just a Bill, I'm Only a Bill. Almost everything we do really relates to the process of how a bill becomes a law. Even the state operating budget, it comes in the form of a bill and it has to pass through the legislative chambers. So I analyze everything in terms of the bill making process. So I just wanna highlight that for you all. A bill has to be introduced by either a member of the House of Representatives or a member of the Senate. That person is called the sponsor. 
once a bill is introduced, leadership, meaning the Speaker of the House or the Senate President, their office refers that bill to a committee. The members of the committee need only give a bill one hearing. And during that hearing, the sponsor of the bill comes to the committee and explains why they think it should be passed. After that, the committee can give discretionary hearings, which is when interested parties like our group and other agencies will come in and either object or support or say we're neutral. And this is how we see this affecting people. What becomes really complicated is those discretionary hearings because the lawmakers who sponsor the bill often champion many issues. And you have to really advocate because they don't have time on bills that you want passed. So we've had bills in the past that we've had introduced. Um, we take the position that we call the committee chair's office every week and say, give this bill a hearing, give this bill a hearing, give this bill a hearing. We have our rape crisis program, you know, send emails. We have them make phone calls again saying, give this bill a hearing. It's really, really critical. And if leadership won't make those decisions, we sort of inundate all of the local program lawmaker representatives so that they're hearing more voices to get more influence. If it can get a vote through committee, if it gets a majority of the committee members to say yes, then it goes for consideration on the floor of that chamber. So if this has gone on in the House of Representatives, it'll end up on the House floor. If they get a majority there, then the whole process has to start over again in the Senate. So it takes quite a while. And then it will go to the governor. And if the governor signs it, it's law. If the governor vetoes it, they have to have um, a veto or an override vote. And that requires more than a regular majority. So all of that sounds really simple, but the legislator has a lot of vacation time built in. Um, and COVID has been a very strange um, adjustment to that. So they start in January of odd number of years. They debate their budget for the entire state for every agency and service that's provided, including schools, rape crisis centers, hospitals, um, anything that's a government funded service um, is discussed and the fate of the finances of that agency get debated in finance committees. They get the budget out in June and then they generally take a recess until September, at which point they will start doing substantive legislation until Christmas and then they go back until mid-January and when they come back in mid-January, they generally will work until the summer, take a long summer break, come back and campaign until the election. And then um, every two years, the entire House of Representatives has to run for re-election. They get two-year terms, and then a third of the Senate is running because they have six-year terms. And so there's not a lot of activity between September and November, and then they have what we call lame duck which is after election, every person's trying to push their legacy through. And that's the hardest time to do legislative work because things move very, very quickly. So we also do a lot of funding advocacy. We do substantive legislation, but our job really is to keep our eye on the ball. Um, lawmakers move really fast. Sometimes they move really fast without any warning. Um, things can stall, they can speed up. It's really unpredictable, which, you know, in a lot of ways is, is very oppressive um, and absolutely not user-friendly. Um, and we have to pay really close attention because if we don't step in and either stop a bad bill or object, you know, we have to deal with the consequences. And, and sometimes objections don't matter, um, but sometimes they make all the difference in the world. That was such an amazing and clear explanation of um, what, what we do, I feel like for, you know, working for the state, I feel like we're doing macro level work, but to like consider that the national level is calling on us sometimes, um, you know, when, when we have an important player that could potentially affect policy. I think that's so interesting. Um, and to like fathom the Supreme Court making movement on, um, survivors is just, like mind blowing. I feel like I've just seen like the Grand Canyon for the first time. <laughs> That's really interesting. Um, I also think, you know, elections and affecting like the movement um, of what's happening in the state house is so interesting. So um, thank you so much.
Something else that I wanted to discuss is the importance of bipartisanship in our work. Um, that isn't always easy. And I'm wondering what your experience with that has been, especially in such an intense political environment. Yes, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, you know, I'll say that I don't have a poker face and that that has never worked in my favor, but the most I've ever worked on suppressing my facial reactions has been uh, doing legislative work. So at the core, we don't want sexual violence to be a partisan issue, and logically, it should not be a partisan issue. But there's a lot of education that's needed across the board for lawmakers. And I think one of the things I find the most challenging about that is that we have new lawmakers in Ohio elected every two years. So there's always a new crop of people that you have to meet and you have to share information with in a tangible way. Um, Ohio is a state that has a supermajority. So we have one party that has almost exclusive control over what decisions get made and what passes, which means that any person who's working in advocacy really knows that in order to get anything done, you have to have a certain member or a certain number of um, that supermajority support what you're doing. And because of that, it really forces you to carve out a strategy um, and really be as personable as you possibly can. So if I'm being honest, my approach has sort of emulated from my dad. It, that's weird to say because my dad works in seed genetics, but hear me out. Um, the core of his career has always been sales. So he covers an entire large state and his whole livelihood depends on his ability to connect with people that are often extremely different than he is. So when I was growing up, um, you know, he traveled a lot, but he did his office work at our house. And so I grew up in the midst of his strategies and his phone calls. And for me, I can honestly say that the successes that we've had as an agency in building legislative coalitions and bridging gaps on issues and honestly maintaining funding support has really come from me modifying his general approach and adhering to the principles that he puts in place in his own work. And I hope that he doesn't hear this because I would never want him to know any complimentary feelings I have about that. Um, <laughs> you can cut that if you want to. Um, but it's really just for me been about meeting people where they are and finding a common interest with every person you can. And very often that common interest has absolutely nothing to do with public policy. I know some lawmakers really like architecture or some lawmakers have a pet that they love to talk about. Or, you know, I, I did a lot of advocacy while I was visibly pregnant. And so a lot of the lawmakers still ask me about my child, which has been an unintentional, very helpful connection to have with people. Um, and so as we do this bipartisan work, when you're doing this, we have to kind of focus on specific responses and approaches to our specific issues and maybe not let other issues that we're passionate about, but don't fully relate to the specific bill we're working on, um, get in the way of that. And for me, that's really hard to do personally, um, but I do find it's a bit easier at the state level. And I think that the, the reason that is, is that when you look at federal policy, especially in the past four years, a lot of very extreme personalities come out and that urge to amplify an image or a more extreme political persona, I personally believe is less intense at the state level because federal level politicians are laying a groundwork for a presidential bid. No matter how unrealistic that presidential bid success might be, that's at the foundation of a lot of lawmakers approaches to what they're doing. They're looking towards how any action they can take might come out in a presidential campaign. At the state level too, it's important to note that people keep their day, their day jobs. So at the federal level, folks go to Washington and that is their job. At the state level, people still go to work. Um, they still maintain their employment. They go down to Columbus a few days a week. A lot of them are working in agencies that do social services. Some of them are teachers, some are lawyers, some are farmers, some are accountants. And so they maintain a day-to-day -day life that is separate from politics. And that actually becomes really helpful too, because you can talk to them about 
their work or ask how their um, experience working in X sector helps um, them understand the issue. But I also think it's important to note that we do a lot of stuff behind the scenes as a means of mitigating the hyperpartisanship. So there are bills that come out and a lot of folks might wonder why did OAESV not put out a big statement opposing this or file any opposition on the record. Um, and that is always a really difficult decision for us. But often what we do is we meet with the lawmaker and we try to get amendments through. So let's say a bill is really, really harmful, but we know that maybe it has the support of the chief executive or the attorney general or other interest groups. And we just know that there is literally nothing we can do to stop that from passing. We will go in with a series of mitigating amendments and say, if you get these mitigating amendments put into this bill, we will not file opposition. We won't come out in support. We won't come out as neutral, but we will not on the record file a piece of opposition for this. And that's helped us get some things done. You know, some bills that we've been very, very nervous about, we've been able to make less harmful. Um, and that's more of an opposition approach than I would say a proactive approach um, in that or sorry, offense, defense, let me rephrase that. That is more of a defensive approach than an offensive approach because when you see something that's going to happen no matter what, you have to take tactical um, approaches to trying to mitigate as much as you can. And we have to really look at who is supporting this objective, how does that affect our other objectives, and what can we do to reduce harm in the most um, plausible way. Yeah, thank you so much. That's what I was thinking when you were speaking. Um, it sounds like a harm reduction um, game, if you will, <laughs> once something is already kind of in motion um, and we know that it's that it's going to pass. So I think that's such an interesting way to look at advocacy. Um, and finding common ground was another theme that I found that you um, shared. So I've got poker face, finding a common ground. <laughs> and yeah, I, I really think that um, it's amazing that you do that. And not everyone is as familiar with um, what that advocacy can look like. So I hope that this um, helps people who might be interested in getting into that work or supporting uh, policy work. So we, we really do appreciate you um, and all of the work that you're doing. And I'm trying not to count down the days until October. Um, <laughs> even though it is Libra season, you will be leaving us. And <laughs> I'm so sad about it, our whole agency is, but we're so grateful to have you as our first field talk. And it's amazing already. <laughs> Thank you. Um, could, could you tell us about the amazing legacy that you are leaving behind, um, specifically the rate crisis line item increase? Yeah, and I'm very Midwestern. And so, um, as you've mentioned, I'm leaving the agency. I will be moving back to my home state of Wisconsin for um, my husband's position, but you know, we're from there. We're very happy to be close to family. But in that, that part of the country, just, it's Apparently very difficult for all of us to accept compliments. So I'm I'm just very honored that you said that, and um, just so appreciate um, you know that that recognition because the the line item project was a lot of work, and I, I do want to make sure I highlight that our executive director Rosa Beltre also did an immense amount of work on that project as well. And so it, there are two ways I think about legislation, one being substantive and one being financial. And the financial legislation has honestly been really what's been going on for the past four years because we've had a number of disrupting factors in our legislature that have prevented the typical pace of substantive legislation. So for us, you know, the biggest success that we've had has not been substantive, it has been the financial, um, which has enabled our programs to continue existing. So I'll give a little history of the background and kind of, of where we're at, but the budget line item did predate me. So 
I still lived in Wisconsin when the line item was introduced for the first time, I think in 2014 was the year that, that first got brought up. And lawmakers vigorously brought this out and said, we need money because we only have about 46 counties that are receiving rape crisis services in the state of Ohio. And that's not acceptable. And I can tell you as a person who worked at a coalition in a different state and has lived in various places all over the country, that is not a normal amount. That is far under what the standard is. Um, and so they got 1 million, just under 1 million on the budget. And within a year of distribution, we got up to 53 counties out of 88. And then we got up to 1.5 million and we were able to incrementally with that yearly disbursement increased to about 76 counties. And I say about because there are some weird factors that go into what county is considered receiving services. And with the recent VOCA budget cuts, it's been a little up and down and I will highlight that in a second too. Um, but we, we went in and this was about my third year working here. And we were finding that the budget just was not enough for us to expand. We'd really hit a cap. You know, we got into the 76, 77 counties and we just could not expand any further. And so we took on an approach where we, we did a lot of data collection. And I am so forever grateful for, um, we had gotten an, an LAV grant that allowed us to bring in um, an attorney and a paralegal full-time to do casework. So I was able to kind of lift myself um, out of that um, additional responsibility and really focus on this. And I went a little bit aggressive and I met with, I think it was 77 lawmakers before our advocacy day. I started meeting with lawmakers in Halloween on Halloween. That was the first day I did it. And I remember because I was so thankful that my meeting was on the phone because I was wearing a purple wig and that just would have thrown the whole mood off. But we, um, we had a really productive meeting and, and I was really inspired. It was with Bridget Kelly, a Democrat from the Cincinnati area. And I just kept meeting with lawmakers. And every day when I'd come into work in the morning, I would set up a minimum of five meetings. Um, and I just sort of made it my passion project that we were going to get this, this line item up 100%, which would have put us at um, I think 3 million per fiscal year. But after we had the 77, meetings with uh, myself and lawmakers. And then we had our advocacy day where OAESB and our local programs met with, I think it was over 90 lawmakers that day as a follow-up to talk more about the budget. And then something I was really excited about that one of our local programs came up with and we emulated across the state was that local programs reached out to their city councils and their like law enforcement agencies and their hospitals and got letters of support sent directly to the lawmakers in their district and to Senate leadership and house leadership and the governor. And really, really just did, the local programs did so much. You know, the mobilization was so great and we were able in the end to get a 227% increase, which got us up to over 4 million per fiscal year. And we thought for sure <laughs> we could get to 88 counties, but as you know, Olivia, and what some of our some of our listeners probably know, is that the Victims of Crime Act grant fund got reduced, and local rape crisis centers lost between 22 and 57 percent of their VOCA funds. And to be very explicit, in a typical Ohio rape crisis center, VOCA funds about 90 percent of their total budget. So these programs were losing between 22 and 57% of 90% of their budget. And there were three programs that lost 100% of 90% of their budget, which meant that this line item increase was a very big reason that many of these programs didn't close their doors. And now I'm going into my like official legislative pitch because we are in budget season again and we are working really hard to get that back um, and it's always hard to go in and say, you gave me a 220% increase last time. I would like, I would like a hundred percent more of that. Um, but if we don't get 10 million, there are going to be consequences and it's important the lawmakers know that. And I think the trust that we've built through that last process has been really important. 
it's it's something that we've worked really hard for together across the state and it's something I will always be immensely proud of. And I'm just really hopeful that the increased visibility of these issues sticks with the lawmakers that are there and the new ones that we're educating and that we really can get to a place where we're not relying on federal funding because the state government, and this is a plug I want every person who ever meets with a lawmaker to make, is that the state of Ohio knows this service is necessary and they for decades were able to rely on rape crisis centers without giving them state rape crisis funding. It was entirely reliant on federal grants and it is, it is an essential service and we will continue to push for that funding. Thank you so much. Gosh, that again, mind boggling um, to, to hear the, the percentages of VOCA and you know, what those cuts mean um, to rape crisis centers, but then to also know that, you know, the work that was being done before that was able to, you know, help um, is so important. And it's something that I am so proud of um, with OAESV and you and Rosa and, you know, the organizing of the local rape crisis centers. Like, I'm just so proud to stand beside you all in that work. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that um, with us. In closing, I would like to know, Camille, what are some lessons um, through your journey that you have learned that have strengthened your approach and work in Ohio when it comes to providing equity for survivors? Absolutely. So I thought a lot about this question and with public policy, any decision we make is going to, it, it is going to, that's not a caveat. I mean, every decision we make at a policy level is going to have a huge and potentially lifelong impact on people that we very likely are never going to meet. And that comes with a lot of heaviness, especially if you do this work for any length of time. And a lot of us can get really defensive or feel this sort of debilitating guilt if we realize that oh no, I, I supported X, Y, Z, and that approach was really harmful. Or, you know, did we support legislation that we no longer agree with after the fact? And a lot of that ties into just what we learn as, as advocates and as people, but also the speed at which the legislative process moves. And when I look back on my own experiences, I see a lot of areas for improvement. And with that discomfort that I had, I just, I made a decision that as hard as it can be to look really closely at things that you wish you hadn't done, or maybe wish you hadn't supported or given it an additional week to think about or ask some questions that I was going to, instead of just kind of feeling like, okay, maybe I shouldn't be doing this anymore, that I was going to keep going and use the skills I've developed in strategy, because I think that can be of service but really change my development approach in terms of how we evaluate who we're listening to, um, how much time we really give legislative matters versus other projects. So one of the biggest decisions or, or things that's been helpful is I'm a people pleaser in general. And so I always wanna say, yes, I will help with this. Yes, I will do this. Yes, I will do this. But that was taking away in my ability to read and review and understand and take the time to run policy by the people it was affecting the most. Um, and so for me, it was about opening my own processes up for internal and external evaluation, um, increasing the number of people that we talk to really, um, and understanding that if I can identify areas for improvement, then it probably is, is good for me to keep going and not you know, completely shift out of it. So I am very excited about the fact that we have sort of scrapped our old approach to the Survivor Advisory Council and we are rebuilding how we approach that um, with a wider you know, information gathering and recruitment approach. Um, and I'm, I'm just really happy that we're going to be creating opportunities for people most affected by this. Um, and along with that, really, really, I think <laughs> that I will preach this particular thing for the rest of my life. And it feels a, a little weird saying it on a podcast, but I think sleep 
is a really powerful tool in decision making. And when we do not give enough thought and rest and sleep on decisions or policy implications that we are doing everyone a disservice. So I didn't talk about this earlier specifically, but the committee notices for bills, they come out late on Fridays, sometimes even over the weekend. And you have until 24 hours before a hearing to submit testimony. And that can lead to really bad decisions. Um, I can identify times in the past and I considered actually looking up some bills to talk about, but then I ran out of time, speaking of time, um, where we don't have to say something positive about something if we're not sure. You know, that is really more of uh, an offensive approach versus defensive because when something is bad, you can very much tell it's bad and you should obviously say something. But if something looks on the surface like it might be good or if a lawmaker that you need to support something else you're doing comes to you specifically and says, hey, I would love for you to support this, it's important to pump the brakes and be comfortable that they don't like that you're taking a long time. Um, and it's just really important to remember that sometimes what can be publicly perceived as a victory that might make the agency feel good or look good in the short term can have really devastating consequences. Um, and so I believe that evaluating and learning and being open to different approaches um, and really just listening to the voices. There are other states that have really looked at the impact of increased incarceration on bills that we just take for granted. So, you know, for me, we've spent a lot of time pushing the removal of the statute of limitations. And I've taken the time to sit down with other states and really hash out is that something that is as 100% approved as we thought it was. You know, five years ago, I would never have thought twice about supporting that legislation. But talking to people in other parts of the country, talking to people who work in other fields, um, talking to people who have different experiences than me and are more affected by, by that has been really eye-opening into what approach I need to take when I'm deciding um, in these quick instances what we might support or not support. Thank you so much, Camille. Gosh, so many awesome points. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go back through all of them, but I totally agree with you know rest and and sleeping and pausing. Um, okay, I am gonna go through them. And um, you know what you were saying about how something can look like a win, you know, on a on one scale, but then on the other could potentially have um, harmful effects on other people. Um, and then, you know, listening to other experts. I think that's the coolest thing about working at a state coalition is that we are connected to all of the other states and to be able to see what other people are doing is just that diversity of thought is so important and, and makes you so much stronger. Um, but I think everything that you have mentioned will be really helpful in um, people figuring out what's gonna work for them uh, as they're moving forward in their equity journey. So I appreciate you so much for joining us today and sharing with our listeners how you are continuing to do this super important work. Thank you, it was, it was really enjoyable to be able to talk about it with you today. Thank you so much. You've been listening to the TL Talk podcast from the Ohio Alliance to End Sexual Violence. This episode was written and recorded by Olivia Montgomery. To learn more about the Alliance, visit oaesv.org.